This is number 25 in the series of 80 Old Testament lectures. In this lecture, we're going to study one of the saddest chapters in the Old Testament. It's found in Numbers chapter 13. And of course, it begins even before this. When God led his people by way of review out of the land of Egypt, they make their way southeast. They cross the Red Sea on dry ground, and God rolls the waters back. And they go south to a place called Mara, where he sweetens the waters for them. And then on down to a place called Rephidim, where Moses strikes the rock and he uh, feeds them. And uh, he slackens their thirst there in the desert. He sends the manna. And then they arrive in the month of June, some 50 days after leaving the uh, Red Sea and the land of Egypt, in the base of the Sinai Peninsula at Jabal Musa, a mountain of Moses. And after 11 months and 5 days, they go north about 300 miles to a place called Kadesh Barnea, which was the southernmost tip of the land of Palestine. And here they send out 12 spies. And these spies, these men, one from each of the 12 tribes, will form a committee. And uh, they'll spy out the land for some 40 days. God told them to do that. And then to bring back the report of the land of Palestine before they invaded it. Two of these spies are very important. One was from the tribe of Judah, and his name was Caleb, and the other was from the tribe of Ephraim, whose name was Joshua. We've already heard of Joshua, and this is our first uh, reading, though, of the man Caleb. And later on in the book of Joshua uh, itself, Caleb will give us one of the finest and most thrilling testimonies in all the Bible. Let's read about this in Numbers 13, verse 17. And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, and said unto them, Get ye up this way southward, and go up into the mountain, and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwelleth therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many, and what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities they be that they dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds, and what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there be wood therein or not, and be ye of good courage, and bring the fruit of the land. And so they go up, the Bible says, and they search out the land probably going several hundred miles in the land of Palestine. They're gone 40 days, and then they come back in verse 25 of chapter 13, and they return from searching of the land after 40 days. And they went and came to Moses and Aaron, and to all the congregation of the children of Israel, and brought back word unto them, and unto all the congregation, and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, now let me just stop and say here, that when they uh, say this at this point, that when they came back, they gave a twofold report. There was a majority report and a minority report. The majority reported first, and that uh, report consisted of ten of the twelve committee members, and then the minority report consisting of two reported. And they give different opposite reports. Here is the report of the majority. Verse 27. We came into the land whither thou sendest, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. There's no doubt about it. The land that God told us, and the land that Moses is planning, uh, desires us to enter, is everything that he said it was. It's a land flowing of milk and honey, but forget it. There's no way we can enter in. Well, why not, the people want to know. Well, because, the majority report says, there's a race of giants in that land, and they're not the jolly green ho-ho-ho giant kind either. These guys are ferocious, ferocious warriors, and we were as grasshoppers in their sight. There's no way we can take the land. Well, the people begin to complain and to murmur and cry. But then the minority report says, wait a minute, we haven't reported yet. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, 
Now, here we have the Menorah report consisting of Caleb and Joshua. Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. And Joshua adds to this. Joshua says, The Lord delighteth in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. You know, sometimes we say, oh, that's just our meat, or that's our cup of tea, or that's our piece of cake, as it were. And uh, they are bread for us. I mean, we'll just, uh, we'll just wipe them out of the saddle. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. And notice what the congregation does. The Bible says they lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel, I'm reading in chapter 14 now, murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the word murmur is a horrible sin, and that was the sin of unbelief and murmuring that kept them out of the promised land. We have a common English colloquialism for it. It means to bellyache, to complain. And that's exactly what they did. Notice what they said. They said, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And now they actually make some type of suggestion that they should return to Egypt. And they said one to another, Let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. I wouldn't have wanted the job that Moses had. You couldn't have paid me. Of course, if the Lord had called me, I would have done it. But I mean, he had a rough time. His face must have worn a whole the skin off of it because he literally crawled on his face to the promised land. I don't know how many times in the Bible we read the words that the people rebelled and Moses fell on his face. And here he falls on his face here. They just don't realize that they're dealing with a holy God. And many times God's people don't realize that. We see so many signs around today. Smile, God loves you. Well, thank God that is a scriptural truth. God is love. And God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But uh, I'd like to see a sign that says repent instead of just smile. I mean... Uh, when God's people sin, they are to repent. Now, the minority report, as we said, uh, gives their words of advice. Let's take the land. Don't rebel against the God. Against God, we can do it. And in verse ten of chapter fourteen of the book of Numbers, but all the congregation bade stone them with stones. They just about murdered the four men on the spot. By that I mean Aaron and Moses, and Joshua, and Caleb. And I suppose they would have, had it not been that the glory of the Lord, the Bible says in verse 10, appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I have showed among them? And again, he says, I'll destroy them. Well, for the third time now, the Bible says that Moses steps in and he, act, he acts as the great intercessor and the, he begins to pray and ask God to forgive them. And in verse 20, verse 19, Moses says, Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people according unto the greatness of thy mercy as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. So again, God recognizes that Moses is the man standing in the gap. And God, of course, today is looking for men to stand in the gap between this evil, sinful, murmuring generation and the holiness of God. And so in verse 20, the Lord said, All right, I have pardoned according to to thy word. I'll go along with this, but I'm not going to kill them, but I am going to punish them, and here is my punishment. Because all these men 
which have seen my glory and my miracles which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have tempted me now these ten times and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. And then he makes a a very sobering statement here. He says that not one person over the age of 20 will enter the promised land. We read that in verse 29. He said, Your carcasses, referring to the majority now, shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you according to your whole number from 20 years old and upward, which ye have murmured against me, doubtless ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save with the exception of Caleb and Joshua. Notice God here says in verse 22, a uh, verse we've already read, they hardened, they tempted me ten times. God kept track. The first began there in the uh, Dead Sea, Red Sea area, and the people said, oh, now God's trying to drown us. Would to God we'd stayed back in Egypt. Well, God rolled the rivers or the waters of the Red Sea back. And he didn't say anything, but he said, that's one. And then they come to Marah, and uh, they drank the water, and they <laughs> spit it out. And they said, oh, now first he tried to drown us, and now he's trying to poison us. What kind of God is this? And God sweetens the waters for him, doesn't say anything, but God notes that's twice. And then the Rephidim, they do the same thing. And God says that's three times. And at Mount Sinai it happens, and that's four times, and five, and six. And finally, God's patience comes to an end. There is a time when God steps in and sets aside his grace and exercises his wrath. You know, the grace of God is sufficient and efficacious enough to cleanse us from all sin. But someone has said that while the blood of Christ will cleanse us from all sin, it will not cleanse us from one excuse. And they were offering excuse after excuse why they couldn't enter the promised land. God says, you don't want to enter the promised land? I won't make you enter the promised land. God did not create a group or a nation of robots where he pushes a button and they have to do his will like some statue. God has created, when he created man, an image or a creature in his own image. And yet he gave man perhaps the most dangerous weapon that a creature could ever have. He gave him the right to say no to his creator. And no other creature or created thing in all the universe has the right that sinful man does. Man can say, I pray thee, have me excused from the marriage of the Lamb, or I will not do the will of my creator. And this is what the nation here said. And God said, all right, not one person over 20, 20 and over, will enter the promised land. And uh, some young people today, it has been observed, do not trust anybody over 30. In those days, God did not trust anybody over 20. But he said in verse 31, But your little ones, you're so concerned about the kids, your little ones, which he said should be a prey, you know, well, we don't want to take the kids in, they'll die, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which ye have despised, but it's for you. Your carcasses, they shall fall in this wilderness, and your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years uh, after the number of the days in which he searched the land, even forty days each day for a year shall ye bear your iniquities even forty years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. Let me stop here for just a moment and make a very important observation. Now, let me say this, and I think this will be one of the most important statements that we'll make during the Exodus stage. And here it is. It is often God's will 
in bringing his children out of the land of Egypt into the land of Canaan, spiritually speaking now, to lead them through certain wilderness experiences. This is vital. The Bible says that they that would live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And we think of that song, some through the waters, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood, some through great sorrow. But God gives a song in the night season and all the day long. It is always God's will on occasion as he leads his people from the land of bondage to the land of blessing to lead them through certain wilderness experiences to teach us lessons. Sometimes it's the wilderness experience of finances, sometimes of job pressures, sometimes it might be of other heartaches and secret burdens that we carry in the heat of the day that only Jesus himself knows about. But let me make the statement, it is never God's will for the believer to wander in the wilderness. The wilderness experience was God's perfect will. The wandering was not. A number of years ago, in fact, in 1952, I entered the Moody Bible Institute, and I remember about that time a song that was very popular among Christians and the students, and what a blessing it's been to my own life uh, through these years. And the song says, My Lord knows the way through the wilderness, all I have to follow. My Lord knows the way through the wilderness, all I have to do is follow. Strength for today is mine all the way. He's all that I need for tomorrow. My Lord knows the way through the wilderness, all I have to do is follow. So again the statement, it is often God's will, dear Christian, to lead you through certain wilderness experiences. It is never God's will for you to wander aimlessly in that wilderness. The wilderness was a part of God's will, but not the wandering. Well, after God made that solemn declaration, uh, then the Bible says that the children of Israel thought, now we've gone a little too far, maybe we were a little hasty in what we said, we'll go anyway. And in verse 40 of chapter 14, And they rose up early in the morning, and got up into the top of the mountain, saying, Lo, we be here, and we've decided we're going to give God another chance. We will go up unto the place which the Lord hath promised, for we all have sinned. And Moses said, No, I'm sorry, you're too late. You've crossed the line. Now, this does not mean that they were going to lose their salvation. We might uh, stop here a moment and talk about this, by the way. Uh, what happened, spiritually speaking, to these people who died in the wilderness? Do you think, are we to conclude that they all went to hell? No, I think it is tragically possible uh, for a person to be saved out of the land of Egypt and yet never to possess his possessions in the promised land, but to die in the wilderness. It means he has a saved soul, but a wasted life. Now, I think we'll probably see many of these in heaven. They were covered by the blood of the Lamb, but they stepped over that invisible line. And there's a time. Uh, there are things that a believer can do. Once he does them, they become irrevocable. That is to say, if a pastor, for example, of a church is involved in an immoral act, and uh, that act is found out, and become public knowledge. The pastor may repent, and he may say, as the uh, nation said here, for we have sinned, and God, of course, will forgive that sin, but the pastor probably then will be pretty well set on the shelf as far as God's concerned. Not that he loses salvation, but he'll become, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul says, I keep under my body and I buffet it, I treat it rough, and bring it under subjection, you less than when I have preached unto others, I myself become a castaway. And what we're saying here is that they crossed the line, and they disobeyed once too often, and now they're going to be limited in their ministry for God. And the word castaway there in the New Testament simply means disapproved. And Paul's great fear was not that he'd lose his salvation 
or not that he would, um, you know, be killed uh, by uh, the Roman army or something or Caesar or the Jews, but his great fear is that he would displease God to the extent that God would have to set him on a shelf, disqualify him from uh, future service. And this is what happened here. And Moses tried to tell him that. No, you've pushed God a little too far. Now, he's made the statement, uh, you're going to have to live the rest of your life in God's second best for you. And uh, you'll have to wander in the wilderness here and just pick up the broken pieces and go on from this point. But the, the people decided in verse 44, but they presumed to go up unto the hilltop, and they're going to try it anyway. Nevertheless, the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. So here they attempt to go forward without the blessing of God. And of course, total disaster followed. Then the Amalekites came down and the Canaanites, which dwelt in that hill and smote them and discomforted them even unto Horma. And so they attempted now by the arm of the flesh to do that thing that God had said he would not bless them in doing. All right, so this ends chapter 14, and this begins, really, the wandering. And for the next about 38 and a half years, all they'll do is wander in the wilderness. And there will be very few productive actions that will take place during this time. It's a rather sad and sordid account. In chapter 15, we have, and I'll just call your attention to a few of the episodes that take place during the next 38 and a half to 39 years. Um, in chapter 15, as I said, in verse 32, we have the stoning of a uh, Sabbath breaker. We read, And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man, an Israeli, uh, no doubt, that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation. And they put him in ward because it was not declared, that is, they incarcerated him in a sort of a stockade, because it was not declared what should be done to him. And the Lord said unto Moses, The man shall surely be put to death. All the congregation of Israel shall stone him with stones without the camp. And all the congregation brought him without the camp, and stoned him with stones, and he died, as the Lord commanded Moses. My, that sounds cruel, doesn't it? Let me point out two things. First of all, this is the only time, as far as we know, in the Old Testament, where a person was stoned for doing this. And secondly, because of the dire circumstances had not Moses cracked down, or had not God cracked down through the hand of Moses here, with a heavy arm, as it were, then there would have been absolute anarchy. And there was almost that now, because every few chapters the people met and decided to string up Moses, and they were going to appoint a captain and go back to Egypt, and they were going to do this and that, and God had to step in, not only to and uh, restore strong law and order to rule with a rod of iron, as it were. So he was not a god of uh, bloodthirsty tendencies, but he was really a god of love, and that's the very reason for this, uh, what might apparently be a, a brutal type of action, but it wasn't. It was an action to protect the future generation, the kids that would grow up and be allowed under Joshua some 40 years later to cross into the promised land. In chapter 16, we find another sad incident. There was another rebellion against Moses, but this time more of the details are given to us. It was uh, led by a man whose name was Korah. And the uh, Bible says that he was of the tribe of Levi, and this made it even worse. And uh, in verse 3, his name was Korah, and he, um, he talked a hundred and two hundred and fifty men, well-known men, into uh, gathering a little, actually it was more or less a posse, uh, sort of a, a lynch committee here. And the Bible says that they gathered themselves together against Moses 
and against Aaron, and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. They said, Who do you think you are? Do you think you're the only one that God speaks with? We're as important as you are. Well, of course they were. But you see, God took a very dim view of this because when they denied, that is to say, when they did not recognize the authority and submit to the authority of Moses, they were not submitting to the authority of God. And in the New Testament, we're told to obey them that have the rule over us. Now here... The book of Hebrews is not speaking concerning dictators. I mean that the husband is to be a dictator or the pastor is to be a dictator, but God has established certain rules concerning the home and the husband is to be the head of the home and concerning the state. There are certain leaders that will lead the state and in concerning his church, the pastors and other uh, men in the congregation, especially the pastor, is to lead the congregation. And if a believer fails or refuses to submit to the authorities placed over him by the state or the church uh, or the home, then he refuses and really disobeys, refuses to submit to the authority of God. And as I said, God took a very dim view of this, and God told Moses that he would take care of it. Well, uh, Korah keeps pushing this thing. And in verse 19 of chapter 16, And Korah gathered all the congregation against them, that is to say against Moses and Aaron, Aaron uh, unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Now they're going to try to really take over now. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the congregation. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And uh, in other words, I'm going to wipe out the whole bunch. Not only Korah, but the rest of the people are behind him too, and he and his 250 troublemakers. I'm just going to uh, just destroy everybody. Well, for about the umpteenth time, now we read this statement, and they, Moses and Aaron, fell upon their faces and said, Oh, God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin and will thou be wroth with all the congregation? They're saying, Lord, if you got to punish somebody, punish the troublemakers, but not everybody. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, All right, this is what I'll do. I'll punish Korah and his men. And then Moses reports back to this uh, waiting delegation of Korah and the rest. And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know, verse 28, that the Lord hath sent me to do all these works, for that I have not done them of mine own hand. I'm going to, I'm forced, Moses said now, to show you that I'm from God and that God is leading me to be uh, the leader, has appointed me to be a leader of this congregation, because I'm going to pronounce judgment upon Korah and his 250 followers. In verse 29, if these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. Uh, God, Moses, I hate to do this, but these men are going to die under uh, a divine plague. And if they die of old age, then you'll know God has not spoken to me. But he said, uh, you, won't, uh, you won't believe me. But in verse 30, but if the Lord make a new thing, and if the earth open her mouth and swallow them up with all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And I think some of the most frightening words in the Old Testament are recorded here in Exodus cha Numbers chapter 16, verse 31. And it came to pass, as Moses had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, that is to say under Korah and the 250 troublemakers that followed in his rebellion, and the earth opened up her mouth and swallowed them up. And in verse 33, and they and all that appertained unto them went down alive 
unto the pit, into the pit, and the earth clothed, closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. This is the first recorded incident in the Bible, as I know, where a man went down into Sheol, went down into hell. Of course, probably the first person to die and go to hell was uh, Cain in the Old Testament. He was the first recorded sinner, as far as we know, that did not get saved. But uh, here is the first incident, first example of this terrible place here called the pit, and uh, later will be called Sheol, Hades, and then in the New Testament, the place of Gehenna. But here is the mention here of an unsaved man who rebelled, refused to submit to the glory of God, to the obedience, the authority God gave Moses, going down alive into the pit. Well, you would think that by seeing all this and experiencing this, that the Israeli people then would say, well, now, you know, we better bite our tongues and not uh, rebel too much because we see what happened to the last rebellion. But in verse 41, it apparently doesn't do a bit of good. God can't seem to impress upon his people that he's a holy God and that he is forced, because of his very holiness, to punish sin. He has to. Not that he wants to, he has to. Apparently it doesn't make, uh, it just doesn't have any effect upon them. Verse 41, But on the morrow, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, Now notice this unbelievable statement, Ye have killed the people of the Lord. You've killed God's believers here. Well, Moses couldn't have done anything. Moses didn't allow... Moses had no power to uh, order the ground to open up its mouth and swallow them alive. And the people knew that. But now they're saying, why, that's terrible. Your prayers have killed God's people. Well, verse 42, when it came to pass, when the congregation was gathered against Moses and against Aaron, that they looked toward the tabernacle of the congregation, and behold, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. And in verse 45 now, God says this, Get you up, he says it to Moses, from among this congregation that I may consume them as in a moment. And then this oft-repeated statements, And they, Moses and Aaron, fell upon their faces. And so here now he makes intercession again. Uh, But this time, God does send some kind of judgment. And in verse 49, what a judgment this was. Now they that died in the plague, he sends a great plague among the people, were 14,700, almost 15,000, beside them that died about the matter of Korah. There was over 250 that died in the Korah rebellion. So we have here some uh, 15,000 people, 14,700. And... uh, you would think, again, that would have uh, made a tremendous impression upon them. But apparently it didn't, because later on they're doing the same thing again. And chapter 17, we have uh, a rather uh, one of the great miracles in the Bible. It's uh, simply referred to by Bible students as the budding of Aaron's rod. And again, the people are saying, We have as much ability as you do, as much talent, as much right to uh, lead our own lives, and we don't want to submit to your authority. And so God says, all right, I'll show them that I am speaking through you, that I am using you, Aaron, and you, Moses. And so they were to take 12 rods. Uh, A rod was sort of a staff, a stick. And they were to write every man's name upon his rod. And so they took... Uh, 12 well-known men and uh, the rods that they carried around, the sticks, the staff that they carried with them. And uh, God says in verse 3, And thou shalt write Aaron's name upon the, tro- the rod of Levi. For one rod, one rod shall he be for the head of the house of their fathers. And uh, so they were to take these, one from each tribe, and Aaron would be from the tribe of Levi, and write their names upon these dead sticks, and then they placed them into the uh, tabernacle. 
into the Old Testament tabernacle. And God says, this is what's going to happen the next day. And it shall come to pass that the man's rod whom I shall choose shall blossom. Here we have a dead stick. Now it's going to bloom and blossom. And I will make to cease from me the murmurings of the children of Israel whereby they murmur against you. I'm going to show them once for all that I am blessing you because I've chosen you in the backside of the desert there at Mount, uh, at Mount uh, Horeb uh, there in Exodus chapter 3. So they do this. And uh, we read in verse 8, The next day, on the morrow, after the men had laid these uh, rods, that Moses went in into the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod or the stick of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded and brought forth buds and bloomed blossoms and yielded almonds. And uh, so apparently this uh, showed them for a while that God was indeed speaking to Moses because they rebelled later on, but we're not told that they rebel against Moses. They just simply rebel. So apparently God uses this to elevate Moses and Aaron in their eyes. That's in chapter 17. Chapter 18 is a chapter we will not get into now except to say that... Um, this records the uh, tabernacle itself and certain qualifications as far as Aaron is concerned. And in chapter 19, we have the red heifer. And this was a certain sacrifice. They would take a red heifer and kill it and burn it and mix it uh, with water. And then if a person was ceremonially unclean, now if he were morally unclean, he had to offer one of the sacrifices. But if he were ceremony, for example if he came in contact with a dead body, this would make him ceremonially unclean. And he would be sprinkled then with the uh, water containing the remains of this red heifer. And that's called the red heifer. All right, uh, also in this chapter, uh, chapter, well, actually, uh, I think that's all we're going to in chapter 19. I want to call your attention chapter 20 because we have uh, the death here of Moses older sister. Then came, verse 1, the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin in the first month, and the people abode in Kadesh, and Miriam died there, and was buried there. Now, in this chapter, Moses, the meekest man that ever lives, that ever lived, according to a passage we just read recently, blows his cool, and after years of hard work, the devil finally snares Moses. And he snares him into the trap of anger and pride. Let me give you the background here. After the death of Miriam, the Bible says, there was no water for the congregation, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people chode with Moses and spake, saying, would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. We wish that the ground had opened us, uh, had uh, swallowed us up alive, as it did Korah and all the rest. And why have ye brought up the congregation of the Lord unto the wilderness that we and our cattle should die here? And why have you done this? And why why did you make us come out of Egypt in the first place? And on and on and on. And... Um, Verse 6, And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they fell upon their faces. How often we read that statement? And the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. And so God says, Look, I'm going to once again bless them, once again determine not to destroy them. So here's what I want you to do. Uh, as years ago, at another place, at another time, to accomplish another purpose, Moses, I had you strike a rock. Now, this rock was probably miles away from the first rock. The first rock they struck on the way down into the Sinai Peninsula. And now this rock that Moses is to speak to is well up in uh, the Kadesh Barnea area, which is probably a distance of several hundred miles. So he said, I want you to, uh, I'm going to work a miracle through a rock again. But this time, I want you to speak to the rock and not strike it. Verse 8, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, 
thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, so thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. Now I wonder why God told Moses the first time to strike the rock, and he tells him the second time to speak to it. We're not absolutely sure, except to say that the Old Testament certainly prepared for and taught concerning the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that once Christ was struck on the cross, and he need not be re-sacrificed again, like the Roman Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation tells us, in each moment on some Roman altar in the world, Christ is re uh, sacrificed and his uh, the uh, wafer becomes the b- body or be- becomes the bread I'm sorry the wafer becomes the body of Christ and the wine becomes the blood of Christ and this is what is called the doctrine of transubstantiation but uh, that's not the situation at all we're told that Christ died once and he was struck only once and out of his innermost being out of his riveted side, there flowed waters of salvation, and he need not be struck again. He need only be spoken to. Someone has said that God will hush every harp in heaven to hear the prayer, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And so the typology would teach this, and he was to speak to the rock this time. Speak to the rock. Well, verse 9, Moses blows his cool. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded them. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, much must we fetch you water out of this rock. And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the waters came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. But God the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believe me not, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Now, we see that he not only refused to speak to it, but he smote it twice in his own anger. He's really making a fool of himself. He's getting up and screaming like a madman and grabbing a rock and beating on the rock, as uh, some uh, imbecile would do. And uh, ye rebels, and here he's embarrassing, he's disgracing himself and embarrassing God. He's a bad testimony uh, to the older uh, generation that sinned, and uh, certainly not a good testimony to the younger generation that was about ready to go into the land of Palestine. And because it was a public sin, and because it was such a heinous sin before God, are in the sight of God, that God determined the punishment would determine then the, uh, I mean, the crime would determine the, determine the punishment. And the punishment was this. He says in verse 12, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believe me not, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. And not only now will all the rest, with the exception of Joshua and Caleb, over 20, not be allowed to go into the land, but now we find where Moses, the great lawgiver himself, will be kept out of the land. 